Dr. Josh Levin uh, is a colleague and friend of the TI. He's been hanging around the TI for a couple of years now, and uh, his enthusiasm is uh, infectious. His, his curiosity is never ending. Uh, we're very happy to have him on board and speak. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about exercise prescriptions. Josh Levin is a family doctor in Victoria with a lifestyle-focused practice where he helps patients make positive changes in their lives through healthy habits. He graduated from McGill in 2012 and obtained his lifestyle medicine diploma from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine in 2019. He's passionate about using medical tests and treatments wisely so that he can practice the art of medicine in a way that is both sustainable and effective in the long term for his patients and himself. When he is not cycling to and from the clinic, he trains and competes as a master's weightlifter. He practices mindfulness and enjoys the occasional artisanal donut. Um, and I'm sure you'll appreciate his passion for this subject. And Josh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. And with that, I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for that uh, very um, generous introduction, Aaron. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I feel very privileged to, uh, to be a part of the conference. So thanks for taking the time to, to listen to this talk. And it's a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, it's uh, a couple of my favorite things. So uh, weightlifting and uh, my editor-in-chief, Agnes, who is just demonstrating her yoga skills here. All right, so today's objectives. First of all, I want to uh, give some background and context, talk a little bit about why I think we should be prescribing exercise. Uh, and then I would just want to do a brief overview of the evidence for prescribing physical activity, um, what I found to be out there, and then talk a little bit about prescribing exercise in a way that I think works best in a, in a clinical setting. And then finally, just uh, a few words about my own experience uh, doing this in my practice and, uh, and some common barriers that come up and, and hopefully some suggestions how to overcome those barriers. So, uh, so why should we be, we be prescribing exercise as doctors and, and pharmacists and, and providers? Well, um, Jane Thornton, who's sort of the guru of uh, exercise prescriptions out of Western University, uh, basically says we're in an epidemic of inactivity. So about 80% of Canadians don't meet the, the current physical activity guidelines. Um, and the WHO, the WHO ranks uh, physical inactivity as the fourth leading risk factor for mortality worldwide. Uh, exercise has demonstrated benefits for at least 30 different chronic diseases. And, uh, and Jamie <laughs> confirmed that in one of his slides uh, certainly for cardiovascular disease, but for many more. And uh, the Swedish National Institute, National Institute of Preventative Health has uh, created a, a great text uh, documenting um, the evidence for, for exercise as a treatment and management strategy for several chronic diseases. I'll leave a link to that at the end of the talk. Um, but for example, exercise can reduce admissions, drug costs, and medical appointments due to mental illness. The WHO actually explicitly recommends that physicians prescribe exercise in their global action plan on physical activity. They also recommend that we need to revamp medical education to help uh, teach uh, medical students and residents about prescribing exercise and the potential benefits. Even the Canadian Medical Association says physicians can reiterate the medical importance of physical activity by reinforcing this message during each office visit and writing a recommendation on a prescription pad. And our very own uh, Doctors of BC here uh, even offers us a template uh, for prescribing exercise on their website. And again, I can offer some links to that at the end of the talk as well, if you're interested. Um, so this is briefly uh, a look at the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology uh, exercise guidelines. They call them movement guidelines. Uh, you see four age categories here, but, but basically this is where you'll find your uh, recommendation to, to get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity every week. Um, each uh, age category has a few subtle differences on that. Uh, but I think, uh, but, but if you take a look at that document, it'll give you everything you need to know about our current guidelines, which 
by the way, are, are quite, uh, have really set the standard worldwide uh, for exercise guidelines, which is, is, you know, yay for Canada. So, so what about the evidence for prescribing uh, exercise? So I sort of did my own um, kind of traditional search, um, looking to figure out in primary care patients, do interventions to promote, promote physical activity uh, compared to either no intervention or some other type of active intervention, uh, increase physical activity levels, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness levels, or other clinically relevant outcomes or even patient relevant outcomes. Uh, I was also interested in whether there were any adverse events associated with prescribing exercise. And I was only focused on systematic reviews. So what I found was uh, 11 systematic reviews that uh, fairly reasonably answered my question. I focused in on six of those that had pooled uh, meta-analyses. Meta those meta-analyses comprised uh, at least 64 different clinical trials, all ranging from about two to 12 months. There were a small handful that went beyond that to about two years. And there were some common features that I noted in all of these studies. So, so for one, there was a huge diversity in the interventions that they considered to be promoting exercise uh, in, in clinical practice. Anything from brief counseling lasting three minutes to, uh, sorry, we call it brief advice, uh, to extended counseling periods involving multiple uh, appointments with different healthcare professionals, um, all kinds of materials that were dispersed from written materials to videos, uh, to pedometers, even in some studies, or or uh, or um, various uh, devices to measure physical activity. So there was a, a whole lot of things, and sometimes these were combined in different uh, in different sort of ways to create uh, unique interventions, and they were compared to various unique uh, um, interventions as well. Sometimes there was no comparator, uh, but sometimes there were uh, multiple comparators in one study try to assess, I suppose, uh, which components of, a, of an intervention were most effective. Um, there were some common outcomes in these trials. So the vast majority looked at physical activity levels and cardiorespiratory fitness levels. Other outcomes that were seen um, much less commonly were things like clinical outcomes like BMI, blood pressure, lipids. Um, several studies looked at quality of life or mental health mental health outcomes, and uh, a few reported on adverse events. Um, so, um, so basically, what I sort of gleaned from all of this is, uh, is that uh, of these six uh, systematic reviews of meta-analyses, we see approximately five gave pretty positive, um, showed a positive effect of prescribing exercise on physical activity levels, only one that did not. Um, but um, I think, you know, uh, what we want to know based on, on that, uh, on the fact that there were so many different interventions is, is what, what actually worked, what were the components of these interventions that were useful. So I had to look really at some of the trials uh, that were done uh, within these reviews and, um, and, and a couple things came up. One is that it seems like counseling, counseling is good in general. So um, counseling is better than no counseling. It wasn't exactly clear whether more is better, but in some cases, it certainly, um, it certainly was true. Um, something else that was, uh, that seemed to be, have a very positive effect for patients was writing things down. So if we wrote down our recommendations or offered written materials, that seemed to be very helpful. And, um, it, and it seemed in some studies, at least that, that, uh, more follow-up appointments or, or more support was, was more helpful as well. Um, in terms of what didn't work or where there may have been some gaps in the research, so exercise referral schemes, so referring uh, patients to uh, exercise professionals or, or to group uh, exercise programs was not any better than less intense, more cost-effective approaches like giving some advice, for example. Um, some of these studies also looked at, at things like um, the nature of direction that patients were given by physicians or providers whether they were given sort of, you know, free reign in terms of, you know, do whatever you want, just do something active uh, versus much more specific um, prescribed recommendations. There didn't seem to be any difference there. Uh, also, um, some studies looked at 
specific physical activities to see whether there was more uptake among patients for specific activities, and it didn't seem like that was the case. Uh, and then just another word about the outcomes. So um, I think, um, you know, given the fact that, that these outcomes were uh, maybe outcomes that we're not used to seeing, if we're looking at the literature, uh, for example, for diabetes medications, um, you're not looking at physical activity levels. And, and so we kind of want to want to know exactly what this means. I think um, it's important to note that, that the uh, literature seems to show that increasing cardiorespiratory fitness as an outcome does have a good correlation with decreased cardiovascular risk. Um, but what it seems to show from, from what I saw in these reviews is that um, what was most consistently improved with these behavioral interventions was physical activity levels. So moving forward, I tend to focus on this outcome. Um, I think it's uh, slightly more, um, well, it's easier to work with, and I think it's more satisfying for patients and providers to look at, uh, to look at that. Okay, so adverse events, um, quickly, they're not very well reported. Um, when they were reported, the rates seemed to be very similar between intervention and control groups. The main adverse events that I saw were uh, minor MSK injuries and falls. Um, some concerns with the evidence. So, so as I alluded to, um, a lot of heterogeneity in the, in the interventions um, and in the comparators as well. So making it difficult to, to compare maybe some of these uh, trials in a, in a, in a meta-analysis. Um, also heterogeneity in the outcomes. So even physical activity levels, there are various ways in which that was me measured. Sometimes minutes of physical activity per week, uh, sometimes bouts of exercise um, uh, per week or per month, and and uh, and so on. Uh, bias. So so there were some sort of common biases that came up in these studies, and uh, one of them is is uh, you know uh, in, inadequate randomization. So so many of these uh, subjects were uh, were were volunteers or they were selected by physicians. Um, also, I think it's important to note that most of the physical activity uh, outcomes were self-reported. So that raises issues around uh, recall bias or sort of social desirability bias, et cetera. And of course, it's very difficult to blind these kinds of uh, complex uh, uh, interventions. And then again, the question of the outcomes, are these the outcomes that we're interested in? Um, I, I, think that, uh, I think that's a question. So let's talk a little bit about how to prescribe exercise. Um, what is an exercise prescription? Well, I really think of it, uh, I think, you know, I guess I'm a believer, but I really feel it medicine, exercise is a medicine. So in that sense, I really think of it, it, it should be prescribed like a medicine. So just like you have a drug, you have a type of activity, um, you have a, a strength of the activity or the intensity, you'll have a dose. For, so that's the amount of, of activity you'll do in a session, and you can measure that in various ways. Um, you want to think about how often um, you're going to do the activity. And I think about how often during the week, because that gives you an idea how close the person is to meeting the guidelines. And then you can even think about things like duration. So I would like you to do X exercise for Y um, times a week uh, for four or six weeks or something along those lines. Um, so I'll just kind of go over my approach. Um, I have a framework that I use and I'll sort of uh, discuss the, 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 the parts of the intervention that I think are most useful and, uh, and then just what I do for follow-up. So my framework is, is pretty simple and, and this is not mine. It's really comes from um, what already exists out there. Um, it's sort of, you may recognize these A's, the five A's. Um, from smoking cessation so and, and other behavioral interventions. So three steps, uh, I think, to the exercise prescription. The first step is to assess. Second step is to agree or advise. And the third, to arrange or and assist in follow-up. So uh, what exactly are we assessing in, in the first step of writing the prescription? So um, the first thing is we want to assess the patient's current physical activity levels. So we'll do that uh, using this validated tool called the physical activity vital signs. Very simple. It's two questions. On average, how many days per week do you engage in moderate to strenuous exercise like a brisk walk? Second question, on average, how many minutes do you engage in, this, in exercise at this level? And that will give you the number of minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. And that kind of gives you an idea of where the patient is on their way to their 150 or whatever their goal is. 
Secondly, you want to do a little bit of an assessment of their motivation. Is this person ready to even start exercising? Um, obviously, that will change the um, you know, direction of, of, an, of an interaction with a patient. I've got a couple of questions here that are sort of suggestions. Um, do you feel that being physically active might benefit your health? Are you interested in being more physically active, et cetera? And three, we do want to do some sort of a safety assessment. And there are uh, detailed uh, guidelines, screening guidelines put out by the American College of Sports Medicine. And I'll have a, a picture on the next slide of their algorithm. Um, but that's not, you don't have to, I would say you don't have to use that. Um, there are other tools. There's the physical activity readiness questionnaire. This is what's used uh, by exercise professionals and trainers. And you probably feel one out if you've ever got a membership to a gym. Um, or you could simply do a, a good medical history screening for pertinent medical conditions and medications. Um, so there's a picture of what the, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends for health screening. And this is really actually, um, this, is, this is the target audience here is, is not just uh, health, health providers or, or primary caregivers or, or doctors, but, but exercise professionals like kinesiologists and trainers. Um, I think... Um, you know, practically speaking in a clinic, um, what you're really looking for are signs and symptoms of cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and metabolic disease. And that's, that's sort of what's recommended by the guidelines. I myself focus primarily on cardiovascular disease, um, you know, and I think, you know, really just asking this person, do they get symptomatic if they go up a flight of stairs, any chest pain or, or lightheadedness or, or any concerning symptoms? And, and if they do, then you want to think about uh, getting them referred to a cardiologist or getting a treadmill test. Um, this slide has got a, a, a sample of what, uh, of, of basically, this is a, a template that I've created for, for a clinical visit dedicated to exercise counseling. And it's sort of got the three elements of the assessment here. So uh, uh, the physical activity vital signs at the top, in the middle is sort of my safety assessment, um, uh, you know, some general uh, questions about the patient's um, limitations, what, what illnesses or injuries are sort of issues for them currently, and then sort of really focusing in on the uh, cardiac history. And then finally, just a few questions about motivation, figure out what the patient wants. The second step is the most important step, I think, and this is where we really sort of get to um, kind of turn on our, our, uh, um, our shared decision-making or put our shared decision-making kind of hats on and really start uh, working with the patient to get them to speak up and talk about what would they like to do um, what do they most, uh, what do they most see themselves doing? And I get them to think in immediate future terms, like next week. Um, the, uh, there's two, I think there's two options here. Um, if you want to, um, just, if you don't have a lot of time, I would say just advise the patient seems like in the literature, just a couple of words about aiming for the 150 minutes a week, uh, seems to be effective. Um, if you want to get into uh, a real sort of individualized exercise prescription, then you sort of um, could use this smart fit framework, which, which is what I use. The smart part is really just, uh, I think, just a, a guideline to give some, some good, solid goals, and that will help the patient feel confident that what they're doing is, is going to be um, sort of doable. And then the fit, the F-I-T-T, -T, that component is uh, getting to the, the prescription of the exercise itself. So uh, frequency, how often in the week, intensity of the exercise, the time they're going to spend doing it, and the type of exercise. And that's really sort of the core of the uh, exercise prescription. Once you've nailed those down with a patient and you, you both agree on that, uh, you want to write it down. Um, again, I think this is a really important thing. They want to have a, an exercise prescription in hand or an email or something like that. Uh, I'm using emails now in COVID times. Uh, I used to write it on a prescription template pad. Uh, finally, uh, arranging uh, follow-up and, and assisting with referrals. So um, follow-up, I generally uh, think about two to four weeks um, initially, and then you can space them out a little bit longer after that if necessary, but it sort of depends on the patient and how far along they are already. Um, and, and at those follow-ups, I really just want to know, you know, how's it been going? Have they met their uh, goals? Have they succeeded or have there been challenges that have prevented them from getting there? Um, if they, if they have succeeded, um, you know, where to next, what, what do they have any goals for, for what they want to do now? Um, maybe you want to start thinking about progressing their physical activity and keeping it challenging for them. If they're not making their goals, uh, maybe a little bit of time to troubleshoot. Why not? What got in the way? Was it time, um, whether they, you know, they got too many things, um, you know, going on at home or they don't, they can't figure out what kind of exercise to do, et cetera. 
Um, and then the assist component, I think some people will need, I think, referral to an exercise professional, and that would be like the physiotherapist or maybe a kinesiologist. Um, if a person sort of has nagging aches and pains, um, and they're not sure what to do, sometimes patients with chronic pain um, can have a lot of kinesiophobia. They get quite um, sort of afraid of of being active, you know, in fear of increasing their pain or, or injuries. So I think in that case, having somebody work with them one-on-one, -on -one and, and that would be somebody that's sort of a qualified exercise professional that could be really helpful. And then resources. So that, that could be anything that you've got um, handy. I think there's some really great stuff out there and I can, I can direct you to some of that at the end as well on the, on the last slide. So here's a, an email that I wrote to a patient uh, last week. Obviously the name has been changed. Um, but basically you see in the top of the email, this is a template that I've created, I copy and paste, and then I fill in the FITT components. So they're highlighted in red there. So you've got the intensity, um, you've got uh, the type of activity, the frequency and the amount of time spent doing it. And then I added in there a couple of resources for this patient. I sort of have my toolbox of resources that I sort of pick and choose from that I've, um, that I've sort of built over time. Always lots of challenges and, and barriers to getting people more active. Um, you've probably heard everything. I know I have. Um, how do we work with that? So I really like, uh, I, I sort of lean on kind of, I guess, pop behavioral science for this. BJ Fogg is, is a behavioral scientist from Stanford. And he's got a very simple, uh, but I think useful three-step model uh, to help people create new habits. And I use this with my patients. So um, the first step is to start simple. So I think about what, what's the smallest, if you could break uh, physical activity down into its component units or simple units, what would be the, the simplest unit you could say that if you accomplish it, you had done some exercise. And for some patients who are inactive, that might just be getting their shoes on and walking to the end of the driveway and back. Um, what I think is important here is, is the goal of, of starting the habit because um, they're, they're not going to um, go from zero to 150 uh, overnight. That's for sure. Second part is to find a time of the day where this little new little habit is going to fit most easily. And I sort of think um, I get patients to think about when they have the most energy, whether that's in the morning or, or later in the day after work, or maybe they have a little bit of a break in a busy work day um, over lunch where they could do a 10 or 15 minute walk. Um, just find a day when this activity naturally uh, would fit. And then the third part is to reward yourself. So BJ Fogg talks about the importance of kind of um, the attaching some positive emotion around the activity. And I really feel like there's um, something to be said for the kinds of, um, you know, um, satisfaction that we get from doing things habitually. Uh, exercise, unfortunately, is not... Um, satisfying in itself for people at least not off the right off the bat i think it takes some time to get there so they may have to kind of find ways to reward themselves buy yourself a new pair of shoes or take yourself to the spa or uh you know something along those lines or even you know if you're nerdy like me you just check a box off and said oh i did this thing that i i wanted to do today and i check it off on my agenda and that gives a little bit gives me a little bit of uh, a sense of reward other tips, so um, tracking habits, I think is a really good idea. Write down what you did or use an app. Stacking is basically this idea from James Clear who wrote Atomic Habits. It basically says, um, you know, stick a new habit on the tail end of a habit that you already have. Uh, that can work. So for example, you know, if, uh, you know, Rangan Chatterjee, who's a, who's a lifestyle doctor in the UK talks about this five minute kitchen workout that he developed while he was waiting for the kettle to boil for his tea. Uh, you know, if you're brushing your teeth at the same time every day, maybe you can do uh, five or 10 pushups on the counter in the bathroom. Um, I think we just have to think creatively there. Uh, and then hacking is kind of like, I guess that's my way of saying is, are, are there ways that you can alter your environment or your daily routine so that physical activity just naturally is, is woven in there it becomes much easier to do. So active commuting, like walking or cycling, um, you know, having your shoes and, and uh, exercise at clothes visible and out there somewhere in the room to remind yourself or even using something like a standing desk can increase uh, your physical activity and, and uh, reduce uh, your risk. Have an accountability partner. I think that's a really good one. Uh, a spouse or, or a friend you trust, let them know what you're doing and, and get them to talk to you about it. And then finally, I think for us, I think it's really important that we walk the walk, to, so to speak. So, um, you know, put a, you know, if you bike to work, 
put your bike helmet in the in the office or wear your running shoes or even have a yoga mat in the in the corner i think there, there is some evidence to suggest that doctors uh who are more active have more success in changing the behavior of their parent of their patients so so go ahead and do it all right so here's a list of of some of my uh top uh resources and, and those should be available in the slides and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, that's my email there, if you like. I will stop sharing. Great, uh, Josh, that was fantastic. Uh, your passion for this subject really comes through. And some great, I really love the end part where you just gave us practical suggestions on what's worked for you and what hasn't. In particular, I, I really appreciate the idea of stacking. Um, and that fellow making tea, I, I often just stand at the counter waiting for my coffee to prep in the mocha pot. And I'm thinking I could do five squats or 10 squats in that time. So it's a brilliant idea. Um, if you're ready, I'm going to go through the questions. We have some interesting ones. Right. So the first one, I asked this question of Dr. Falk. Are there head-to-head -head trials of exercise therapy for disease outcomes versus drug treatments for common diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease? If not, why not? Yeah, that, that is a good, a good question. Um, so I, I'm not aware of any head-to-head -head trials comparing exercise to drugs. Of course, there's a pretty well-known network meta-analysis, uh, and I even remember the author's name. It's NACI, N-A-C-I. Uh, I don't remember the journal, but that's one that's often quoted in the literature and looks at uh, physical activity compared to, uh, I believe it's uh, various uh, drugs for hypertension and looking at the outcomes of, uh, of systolic and diastolic pressure. But again, that was a indirect comparison. So I'm not aware of any uh, direct comparisons in the literature. Okay. There, there, I don't know if it's the same review or another one. I saw one that sort of modeled the effects from studies of exercise interventions and how they indirectly relate to the drug effects we know from drug clinical trials. So I'll try to put that in the syllabus as well and maybe the NASI paper so people can take a look. But thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Do you find the word exercise turns some people off? Have you referred to physical activity exercise in a different way that's more compatible with people? Like, you know, if, if my wife says we're going to have salad with dinner, that that's a... <laughs> That scares me. So is, is there something in the language that you found that helps? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the language that we, that we use makes a big difference, um, certainly around physical activity. And actually, I never, almost never use the term exercise because I am a little bit aware that that does have connotations for some people. Um, I know that the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology actually purposefully use the term movement guidelines and not physical activity guidelines for that reason. Um, and, and I think that that's sometimes that can be an easy way to uh, broach the topic with patients is just say, you know, are you what, what do you, you know, what are you doing for movement? Are you moving much? You know, um, how do you get around um, some people, the concept of exercise seems completely foreign to them. And it's a bunch of sort of sweaty folks in a gym lifting weights, and, and they couldn't imagine anything more repulsive, actually. So, so I think that the important thing is to try to reach everybody. And I think when you're framing it in terms of movement or physical activity, um, you know, whatever really works, but it, because I think, you know, something that I've seen from the literature anyways, is just that it really doesn't matter what you do. Um, it all helps. It all seems to, uh, contribute to, to reducing your risk of early death and, and cardiovascular disease. So something is better than nothing. And that something is really something could be anything <laughs> as long as, as long as it's involving muscular contraction. How about that? <laughs> Great advice. Okay, the next question. Motivation is most likely one of the largest challenges. Do you have any pro tips on how you help people in that regard? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, again, I, I think it's really important to, I think if a patient is, my, my philosophy on that is if a patient is showing up to their appointment, they have some motivation to get better. So I think there's something there. We just have to find it. And, and um, it, there's often, you know, people's ideas and things get, get in the way. And Certainly what's been helpful for me is, is just doing a little bit of reading around and, and training around motivational interviewing. I think that's a, a can be really helpful if you have the time. Um, otherwise, I think, again, coming back to these simple ideas um, by BJ Fogg and James Clear, uh, those are really useful. So shrink it down really small. Um, mm -hmm. I think if, if you tell somebody, listen, if you go out for, uh, you know, if you go out, out, outside 
and uh, walk around your block or even just to the end of the street and back that I still count that as physical activity. And if you can encourage them to do that on a regular basis, it, it sort of builds a sense of kind of self-efficacy that I think actually, I think it's a learned behavior and, and they tend to, to start to get more motivated once they've started to do those small things. So I guess it's really just start small. Um, something is better than nothing. And um, yeah. And if you, if you get a chance to, to, to do anything on motivation or interviewing, I think that can be really helpful. Great. Thank you. The next question, any type of exercise is a benefit. Wondering if there's consideration about gender or cultural references to exercise activity that you have used in your approach when prescribing exercise. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so one of the reviews was a Cochran review that looked at whether um, speaking to gender, whether men or women uh, were more likely to uh, respond to interventions to promote physical activity. Um, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of difference. I believe one study showed that um, more, in town, more intensive counseling sessions seem to be more effective for women. Um, but I don't really discriminate, I guess, in my clinic. Uh, I, I think, again, I really leave it up to the patient. I think about what, you know, I think one of the questions I do ask that sometimes is helpful is I ask them, you know, can you remember a time when you were regularly active or when you were enjoying being physically active? Mm. And I, they may have to go back in time to think of something, but they can often come up with, you know, I like to ride horses or I like team sports or I liked walking out in nature. Those start to give you some clues as to what they might uh, be, uh, be able to get going on, you know, today or tomorrow. So I think you, it's really individual and, and, you know, you know, you know, I, there are stereotypes. I'm sure there's, there's women who play contact sports and there's uh, men who like gymnastics and dancing. So, you know, I just, I don't, I don't think it matters. <laughs> okay. Good yeah. advice. Um, any value to embedding kinesiologists in primary care settings to work collaborative, co collaboratively with people like you? Uh, I think there is. I mean, obviously there's the, the big issue is billing and things like that. But I think what kinesiologists can bring is sort of this um, one thing they can bring is an, a, a way to assess patients, uh, like a functional assessment that I've often thought about, you know, is there a good way to sort of do a functional assessment? There are some tools out there. Um, to do these kinds of assessments yourself in the clinic. They're very brief. I don't know what the evidence is for them, but a, a kinesiologist might be able to do something a little bit more in depth. So I think that that's a useful thing. And then again, this idea that an exercise professional who can work one-on-one -on -one with a patient can really kind of coach them through some of those sticking points, those mental barriers they might have around movement that, um, you know, like chronic pain or fatigue and things like that. So I think there's there's certainly is a, a role for them if they can be integrated in some way with the billing process. Okay, and we have one minute, so I'll give you one last question. Uh, sure. You have to act fast. Um, how do you convince the working poor to put exercises into the priorities of their lives? Sorry, the working working poor. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I think, so that there, I think that that has to happen on multiple levels. I think, you know, as, um, you know, on a social level, we have to advocate for, you know, having, um, you know, gyms and places like this, um, offer either subsidized memberships or have, um, sliding scales for low income. Uh, I think that as providers, we have to be aware of that as a barrier for people and think about, um, you know, and even on a bigger scale, we need to make the environment more conducive to things like commuting and walking and things like that. Um, on an individual level, again, I think it's maybe finding ways of weaving it into your day. You don't need equipment to exercise. I usually tell people if you want to get a piece of equipment, get a piece, get a resistance band, maybe a mat. Um, so I don't think it, um, I, I think we can work around barriers. You just have to be a little bit um, creative and, and maybe work with patients on that one. Great. Uh, and not a question for you, but a comment. I didn't know HealthLink BC has exercise professionals accessible by dialing 811, and that's Monday to Friday. So that's a great resource that I didn't know. Um, Josh, thank you so much. We're so happy to have you a part of the TI and finally present at one of our big events, and we'll definitely have you back. So enjoy the break, and hopefully you can stay around for the rest of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much. All right.